welcome to Heliotropes. My name's Julia. And my name's Kodro. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the Israeli occupation and genocide of the Palestinian, of Palestine and the Palestinian people um, with some historical context and also sharing um, what's going on now and maybe some of the mainstream media narratives and talking a little bit about that discourse and some um, common responses to people who are for the free Palestine and why they're uh, ridiculous. Um, and just to throw this out there, you know, uh, as far as the historical context that I'll be able to provide, I'm not, a, you know, expert in this. Uh, I'm not, you know, here. <laughs> I don't have, anyway, my point is, um, I know some history about it, I know some context, and what little I know now, I'm constantly doing research to know more as I have been doing over the past few years to learn about this because, you know, like a critical piece of being able to effectively show, in my opinion, solidarity with the struggles of other people is to understand the history of those struggles. So you can really understand like the context of the struggle, right? Because I mean, like we're gonna, you know, talk about, um, later on, a lot of people get wrapped up in <laughs> what's going on in the moment, right? Like what things look like in the moment. And if you just, if something, if, right, like Hamas catches your eye in the moment uh, and you've never seen anything else before, you're going to think, right, you're going to, that's going to inform your opinion differently than if you've been studying the conflict and you've been able to see that, oh, for like the past 70 years, you know, <laughs> like the state of Israel has been the aggressor. Mm -hmm. so. And having said that, because that piece is really important, and there's also um, a some commentary out there that this is that the relationship between Israel and Palestine and Israelis and Palestinians is incredibly complicated, and that you need to understand all of the history on it before you make a decision about it. And we are firmly against that stance too, <laughs> that it's very clear what is happening regardless of us, um, even though we don't know the entire history and all of the details. What is happening is very clear, it is a genocide and um, the Israelis are the perpetrators and the Palestinians are the ones who are suffering. And so to be for the people, um, being with the Palestinians and being in solidarity with the Palestinians and supporting a free Palestine um, is the right place to be. So despite complications, that doesn't mean that we can't take a stance, which is also part of why we're talking about this today, even though we don't know everything. Yeah. And to Julia's point, uh, just the last thing I'm going to, you know, build off from what you said is, you know, just as far as objections are concerned, that's a common thing is people will be like, oh, well, I mean, you're not Palestinian. <laughs> you don't live in Israel, right? Two different things. Uh, you don't know the whole story, right? Like, who are you to make a judgment? And, you know, my rebuttal to that is, I mean, who knows the whole story about anything, right? Every person <laughs> tries to know as much about their own story as they can, let alone about everyone else's story. Um, so just right off the bat, that's not a valid argument, right? Like our point isn't that we're trying to learn the whole story. The point is with every, you know, situation, there is <laughs> enough to know if you look at what's going on to be able to form an informed, uh, rational opinion and... We're about to share, you know, our opinion. I mean, if you don't already get it, uh, mm -hmm. based on what little we do know, because mm -hmm. there's plenty to, you know, justify that opinion based on what little we do know. Yeah, and we can provide links in the description to experts um, and their texts and commentary. Yeah. Um, so without further ado. And speaking of experts, uh, Noam Chomsky has done a lot. I mean, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying, you know, like when it comes to foreign policy, when it comes to specifically like understanding how the United States as a global superpower has navigated <laughs> for the past yeah, 70 years, um, foreign affairs, Noam Chomsky is like one of the go-to people. Like, yes, there are other people to go to, but I mean, he's been particularly pro pro prolific um, out there, and he's well-sourced, right? So um, he cites his sources 
He's got lectures, he's got books, he's got articles, lots of writing on these things. So if you're in doubt, if you're in question, you want to know where to go to, he's a great place to start. Um, and one of the things he says about this conflict is actually, you know, very similar to what Julia just shared. As far as a lot of people do, you know, get bogged down in this idea that uh, it's a very complicated situation. I, I think I learned in school that like middle school or high school that this that the conflict goes all the way back to like like 2000 years, <laughs> which is ridiculous because I feel like I had pretty good history teachers in high school. Um, so like the fact that one of them might have even said this is kind of, you know, nuts. But no, I mean, like Noam Chomsky's position, which again, if you look at all the facts, makes sense, is that no, this is a very, there's like, the answer is very clear um, as, as far as what to do. You know, it's, uh, okay, so I guess we go back. If you don't know, and maybe we can timestamp this for video purposes. If you don't know what the conflict is, what's going on, um, oh, thanks. What's happening is in you know World War One. In order for the Allied powers, Britain, United States, France, whatever, to win the war, Britain went down to you know like Israel Palestine area and made a bunch of deals with a bunch of people. They made some deals with Italy. They made deals with France. I think uh, they made deals with different people um, about Turkey around uh, the area that is today known as Palestine um, because that area and like Turkey and like most of the Middle East belonged to what was called the Ottoman Empire. This is a little further back than you need to know, um, but the point is <laughs> you can trace really the roots of this conflict to World War I and Britain. So like as with most of existing problems in the world today, you can trace them pretty handedly back to Britain. Um, Britain issued the Balfour Declaration, which was just a statement by someone whose name is Balfour that said that, hey, you know, like, whether it's good or bad, we think uh, <laughs> that it's in the interest, in the best interest of everyone for there to be a Jewish state um, and for that state to be Israel in this contested land that we kind of like promised to a bunch of different people. Everyone except for the Palestinians who were living there. Um, fast forward a few years and, right, the Holocaust happens. And, and really, we go from the Holocaust in like 1940, 39 to 1945. We go back 100 years to, um, I mean, Europe at the time. It was just super anti-Semitic, right? So that is important to keep in mind because it's going to, again, inform a lot of the current, like the... Uh, arguments today around this issue uh it really like all of that you know anti-semitic violence from uh and not to underplay it or downplay it or anything like what happened in like the holocaust as far as the holocaust that was a very clear progression of what would happen one what one would expect to have happened if really the you know anti-semitic sentiments that were roiling in you know 1800s, 1900s Europe um, weren't addressed. And of course they weren't. And then it wound up in this really gross, systematic uh, recreation of everything that Europe did to uh, African people, you know, except this time they were doing it to Jewish people. Um, so that happens, except, you know, of course, yeah, not to be like this, but like <laughs> when it happens to African people, you know, people are like, ah, you know, like write it out of history. But, you know, when it happened to, you know, Jewish people, Jewish Europeans, because it's also important to note that Judaism is not an exclusively European phenomenon. It actually originated in the Middle East and, you know, some of the earliest adopters were African people. Uh, really important to keep in mind. But, you know, unlike the African situation, you know, after World War II, uh, uh, pretty much the UN, which was formed, promised the land of Palestine to um, open it up to Israeli uh, settlement. And that began, like, really the modern troubles. Um, you have anything you want to... I think an important part of uh, 
stealing that land is also that all of these countries didn't want Jews to settle in okay. their lands, right? So, right. like, during the Holocaust, and one of the reasons that so many Jewish folks were still in Germany and Poland in that area at that time was because other countries were closing the borders, including the states, right? And so, and the United States had a significant role in taking Palestine and giving and creating the Jewish state of Israel. Right. Um, yep. <laughs> Uh, and this is also going to be important coming up, but again, you know, as much as I so cite Noam Chomsky on this, you know, podcast, this is particularly like, this is where, like, again, if you're going to go to him for anything, go to him for knowledge on this. Um, and he tells this anecdote from like his own experience. Like when he was young, he got his start in activism as a Zionist youth activist. And pretty much what his position was back then is that, you know, like Zionism is the movement for um, Jewish people to have their own land where they can like exist in peace and security. That is a stark difference, right? Like his position hasn't changed, right? That's, this is what he says is since then, like since the 1930s, because <laughs> he's old, you know, his position hasn't changed on Zionism. What has changed is the definition of Zionism. So when people talk about Zionism today, it's really important to keep in mind that what's being discussed is not uh, land or, you know, like security in the context of just being able to go somewhere and be at peace. What's being discussed is specifically statehood, right? And that's very different, you know, when you say, right, that's the difference between just going somewhere and being able to like exist and going somewhere and creating a government that can then impose on other people who are occupying that land. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's one of the main um, lines for pro-Israeli people right. right now is that Israel has a right to exist. And really, states do not have a right to <laughs> exist. Yeah. People have a right to exist in peace and safety and right. freedom. But Israel does not have a right to exist. The United States does not have a right to exist. Right. No right that's uh, right. And this kind of gets into an authority thing, because when you're talking about rights, you know, this, this question of who's the ultimate authority on that. And as far as statehood is concerned, <laughs> the ultimate authority on like whether or not a state has the right to exist is the state itself. Right. So it's a self-justifying authority, which if you really look at that, that, you know, it doesn't say much. Right. Like it says more when right you look at a country like the United States and then you can say, OK, all these countries around the world endorse that right to exist. But if you look at Israel, right, the Israel situation, occupation of Palestinian land, it's a slightly different story, right? Because um, Israel has made itself a pariah state, right? Like in general, you know, just from experience, most countries in the world don't like it when, you know, they're being oppressed, bullied by uh, more powerful nations, right? And Israel has been doing that pretty like blatantly for decades. So a lot of countries are out there questioning, like, mm, <laughs> I don't know, like, you know, if anyone has a right to exist as a state, that's not it, because they're really breaking all the rules. And again, it's not just because people don't like Israel or don't like Jews, right? Yes, anti-Semitism does play a role in the way people approach the situation. But as far as the situation itself, you take anti-Semitism out of it, Israel is breaking international laws frequently whenever they engage with Palestine and that <laughs> lends itself to you know fostering this pariah state character where no one wants to associate with you you know mm -hmm. yeah I mean what you said just brings up so many pieces and I don't want to take us too far away but um there might be a question coming up about Huh, well, if Israel keeps breaking international laws, like, how come nothing's happening? How come no one's stepping in to do that? Like, yeah. to protect Palestine and Palestinians? Mm -hmm. And the answer is the United States, <laughs> basically. I mean, that's, like, what the answer boils down to, right? That the United States last week, this week, last week, sure. has vetoed the UN's no, recommendation week. for Israeli ceasefire three times. Yeah. The U.S. was like, Israel has a right to protect itself. Joe Biden, 
Mm-hmm. Yes, Joe Biden, Israel has a right to protect itself, and we're going to send them billions of dollars so that they can continue to defend and protect themselves. So when people are like, how come the UN's not doing anything? It's because the UN is made up of... The U.S. Of the U.S., <laughs> right. Like, the yeah. U.S. has veto power in that situation. Overwhelming veto power. Right, despite the other handful of countries who are involved and who are calling for... Israel to back down. And now, like, today, you know, Israel announced that they were going to stop. Whatever that means in this present moment. I mean, after 11 days of incredible destruction, um, after decades and decades of incredible destruction, too. So I think that's an important part, too. Like, they're breaking international law with the support of the United States, who has veto power in the UN. The UN is fucking useless. (laughs) Well, that's not true. It's very useful to the powers who are in it, right? It's like the billionaires who are running the United States. Right. And other European countries. Well, yes. Um, So, to Julia's point about why, right? Like, why is Israel allowed to do all this? And the role that the United States plays in allowing this to happen. We've got to fast forward a bit. Um, So... Oh, go ahead. Well, I don't think we should fast forward because I think we should mention 1948 in the Nakab. Okay. Because we mean, kind of stopped like here. You <laughs> yeah. And then I took us away. Well, the Nakba. Yes. So the the in Nakba. 1948, um, that's pretty much after this UN uh, you know, partition plan was drawn up in 47, um, it opened up Palestinian land. Well, one, it made Israel, right? Like Israel, what it is today, like the state of Israel. And that, you know, statehood <laughs> opened up Palestinian or, you know, Isra- opened up the land for Israeli settlement. Now, it is important. It is important to note for the sake of, you know, fairness and whatever, that Palestinians have been on that land uh, uh, for a long time. There have also been... Uh, well, actually, so here's the thing. Palestinians have been on that land for, like, ever, <laughs> okay? So Palestinians, a lot of people, again, today associate Palestine and Palestinian identity with uh, Islam mm. and Arab, uh, Arabian ethnicities. Now, the thing is, that is a gross, and when I say gross, I, I, mean, I don't mean nasty. I mean, like, huge, right? German, gross. That's a gross oversimplification. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Palestinians who were living on that land were Jewish, right? They were Christian. Mm -hmm. They were Muslim, right? Because, again, we're talking about Palestine, Israel. Like, you look at the cities in this place, that's the Bible, right? This is where the Bible happened. And then it also happened in other places. But this is it. So when we're talking about, like, Palestinian identity, we're talking about the whole gambit of, you know, like, classical... Uh, Judeo-Christian Abrahamic religious identity, okay, um, and practices. So Palestinian means Jewish people who are living in Palestine. Christians is uh, Muslims who are living in Palestine. All right. So when people say, "Oh, you know, Jews have a right to you know like whatever biblical whatever uh, land claims," like I mean, again, that's irrelevant because what we're talking about is the people who are living here. And then 48 happened, 47, 48 happened, opened up to settlement, uh, sanctioned by the UN. And then that opened up Israel to settlement, not by like, you know, Jewish people who had already been living there. Otherwise, it wouldn't be settlement, right? Settlement implies people are coming from somewhere else and moving to this place that we're talking about, okay? When we're talking about the, you know, settlers in the United States coming from England or other European places to the United or to the new world, right? Mm-hmm. Where they did not belong. <laughs> yeah. And again, that's the thing. Yeah. It's not that we you know, th- this isn't an anti-immigration thing, right? The point is what happens when you get to that place? And what we're talking about here is settler colonialism. Okay. So that specifically, if you don't know, refers not just to like, you know, like immigration, like is happening and that, you know, we endorse, right? Like who's going to try to stop immigration besides colonizers? But like settler colonialism is when you come to a place and in order to like make your living in that place, you actively forcefully push people out. Okay. 
That's one of the things that's happening in uh, what Sheikh Jarrah, where um, I mean, it's just if you don't know it, Sheikh like S H E I K H Jarrah. It's another word, J A R R A H or something. And what's happening is just like a continuation of what's been happening over years, and you can. Google it now to really have like, you have something to Google now, okay, like a neighborhood. And it's, um, I mean, it's Israelis coming in uh, uh, following Jewish law uh, or Israeli law to this neighborhood in Palestine. I, I don't know where exactly. I assume it's in uh, the West Bank and one of the many partition territories now. And just moving in, like literally people are living there and like, like Palestinians are living in their homes and then Jewish people are coming to the neighborhood and being like, we live here now. With the support of the Israeli military. Right. Like right. literally being escorted. Yeah. It's like gentrify, gentrification uh, you know, on crack is like my go-to thing. That's the first thing that came, right, on steroids, mm -hmm. you know, like. Because they're not buying anything. Right. They have state and military support and then when they are stealing these homes, the Palestinians who are there don't have any right to return to them. Right, right. And that's a big thing that we should definitely make sure we, it, we get to in a bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, my point with that is that Sheikh Jarrah is like, if you don't understand what settler colonialism is, that's one thing. Like, yes, it, you know, in the United States, it happened a while ago, we still need to like rectify that, right? It is the nation's original sin, but it's also Israel's original sin. And the thing is, just like in the United States where it was happening literally, I mean, you could argue that it's still happening, um, but like as far as um, when it like, you know, stopped in a certain sense, right? If we start in like the 19, in the 1400s, we could say it was happening up until, easily up until the early 1900s, okay? So for 500 years, and now like it's happened so much that it's hard to see an example of it. But here in Israel, we can literally see settler colonialism, again, gentrification on steroids, happening like virtually before your eyes, okay? Um, so that's just something to keep in mind is that, you know, what we're talking about here is a people who were living in a place and then people came from other way, elsewhere. And again, like this is European Jews, not like, Jewish people who were already living here uh, in Palestine, but like literally people who had been living <laughs> in Europe for generations, okay? Because people, anyway, we'll get to that. But coming from Europe, coming like there was mass exodus from Germany, obviously during World War II, and people, you know, Jewish people started immigrating from Europe to Palestine, from the United States to Palestine, mostly from Europe, okay? Um, and then whatever other parts of the world where Jewish people were being severely, uh, discriminated against, persecuted. Uh, okay. So now we, uh, and that's refer, so like with that settlement, this huge influx of, um, Jewish settlers, yeah, Jewish settlers in Israel, into Israel, what that, well, into, Palestine. into, yeah, into Palestine, into the state of Israel as it was just created out of the land of Palestine. Um, what was happening was that Palestinians, native indigenous, the indigenous population was being displaced, okay? Uh, so again, this isn't something that happened just like, oh, you know, like, da 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 la da you know, like, oh, we're here, neighbors, right? It was like, no, like, this is, this is our place now. Um, and, Okay, so and it is important to keep in mind also, right? This isn't to say that like, anyway, I'm going to fast forward. you have anything? To... Well, I think the right to return and who has oh, the yeah. right to return is important in this um, aspect too, since this is like the first mass forced like displacement of right. Palestinians on the land in recent, in recent history too, that... Um, Palestinians do not have the right to return to their land, to their place. So after they are forcibly removed and displaced, they aren't able to go back. However, every Jewish person has a right to return to Israel. So you may see like on social media that there are, and some of the people right now, right? Like some of the Jewish settlers right now are American. 
who are going to Israel and stealing land. So you might be seeing on social media, like there have been um, some um, Jewish and Palestinian pairs um, together who like, you know, are talking about a right to return versus not a right to return. And so this wipes out generations, right? I mean, it's the parallels between this and the indigenous genocide in the now United States. I, they're just... Um, Stark. Yeah. And I mean, just to you know, clarify, right to return is jargon, right? So if you don't know what right to return is, right to return, right? We're not talking about like a God-given right or whatever. We're talking about the Israeli state says <laughs> that if you're uh, Israeli, if you're a citizen, oh, sorry, not even, right to return in the Israeli context means if you're Jewish, if you're a Jewish person um, who lives outside of Israel, you have a right to citizenship on your homeland, which is Israel. Um, so says, so goes the, uh, the rhetoric. Okay, so like we're talking about a specific right, like we have the right to free speech. A legal here. right. Yeah, a legal right. Um, so right to return, they have the right to return. Whereas, um, well, when Julie says Palestinian people don't have a right to return, that doesn't mean they don't like like that's not like we're not talking about a human right there. Again, we're talking about a legal right, mm -hmm. where somehow, I'm not sure how this works, and honestly, like, I hadn't brought it up because I don't know when the right to return was, or the, when, or what entity barred Palestinians from the right to return, but... Well, I think it's been decades, and I don't know everything about it, but some of the stuff that I've read has basically been like, when the settlers come in and are taking the land or they're occupying and taking the territory, if you are not there, then you never existed. Right. And so then you no longer are able to have a passport or come back in and enter the country. And even people who do have um, like uh, a passport or have been there before, like there's lots of stories coming out now about people who's, um, whose parents are Palestinian and maybe were born in the US or in Canada or in other places and have a U.S. passport or a Canadian passport, cannot get a Palestinian passport. And when they return, like when they go to visit or whatever, um, when they land at the airport, they are put in the Arab line, like in the Arab room, which there are lots of conditions there, as you can probably imagine, and are questioned and then sometimes aren't allowed in the country. So they're not allowed to return. And then, I mean, what I'm talking about in terms of the right to return, though, is, like, the right to go back and, like, reclaim or, like, have that house, you know, like, your land, your space, to move back into that territory. Right. And this becomes, obviously, super problematic because what it, how it served, like, how it um, manifests in practice, like Julia said, is um, as, you know, Israel expands literally expands the state of israel is expanding into palestinian territory they take it over and they say okay you can't come back to this territory so that just allows israel's uh dominion over palestinian territory to continue to increase while also decreasing and splitting apart geopolitically which is critical that's a crucial piece mm -hmm. the territorial um holds holdings of palestine um, so if you haven't looked at a map of like what things look like at now and versus what things look like before, I mean, social media is a pretty, I mean, they're all over the place, but like also a Google search really, you know, Google search, uh, just like Palestine, Israel land timeline or something map, right? Map timeline. And what it'll show you is what things look like in 1947. So, um, and like, Presumably some other years as well. And we've gotten one here from like, you know, historic Palestine to 47, 67, and 2020. Um, and what you'll see is for the most part, you know, both Palestine and Israel are divided into three territories as of the UN partition. So, I mean, I think this is an th important thing to keep in mind is that, yes, Palestinian settlers were being displaced by the creation of the state of Israel. That being said, there was somewhere for Palestinian people to go. And, you know, keep in mind, like, <laughs> technically this argument still exists. 
there is technically somewhere for Palestinian people who are being displaced to go. Uh, my point here is that... An walled open air prison. Right, yeah. My point is that that doesn't make the situation better that people have somewhere to go. Because, yeah. again, you have to look at the whole thing, not just pick, you know, parts of what's going on. But, you know, it just, you know, it's important to... I think it was important to note. So, keep that in mind, right? Like, there's two northern territories, Israel, Palestine, uh, two central territories, and then two, you know, southern territories, for both Israel and Palestine. Both Israel and Palestine had territories along the Mediterranean Sea, which if you know anything about geopolitics, is very important because access to the sea, especially on the Mediterranean, right? Like that's a huge, like even going back to, again, antiquity, uh, trade, you know, like it's just, it's, it's an ocean, right? It's a sea and the waterways are super important for trade. Uh, so that's super important to keep in mind. Um, they both had land, they both had, uh, Jordan bordering on the, the, anyway, my point is, fast forwarding here. So, we leave the Nakba, and it's called the Nakba, right? We have, uh, you know, as African people of the diaspora and just of the continent, we refer to the transatlantic slave trade, right? Because that's, you know, sanitized European language <laughs> to describe literal mass kidnapping and murder and enslavement, you know? We call it the Ma'at, sorry, sorry, the Ma'afa, all right, Ma'afa. That's the great disaster, right? Because you know, we were minding our own business, doing, you know, good and shit. And then Europeans come along and like, fuck this shit up. And, you know, you know, 100 years later, they're like, we cool though, right? You know, <laughs> it's like, nah, that shit was a disaster. And we're still trying to recover. Okay, so we call that the Ma'afa. Um... And the Palestinian uh, disaster is called the Nakba, okay? Uh, so that's something you can, that's another Google word, Google that. Uh, Nakba in 1947-48 uh, continues, and this is again very rough history, but we're going to fast forward to the next decade. So um, this is where the United States starts to become important. Uh, if you know, again, U.S. history and world history 1950s and generally like the immediate aftermath into the 50s of uh, the world, uh, World War II um, was the beginnings of the Cold War. And the thing to keep in mind with the Cold War is that it was all about uh, power, right? So after World War II, the major rivals to US power being the European countries, Britain, France, Germany, we're in shambles, right? The Marshall Plan happened, so the U.S. is like, yo, we're going to aid, we're going to lend y'all, like, a ton of money, okay? So you can recover and rebuild. And low-key, like, the Marshall Plan, all that money that was being lended, that was, you know, like, investors, American investors, American businesses, American companies investing in European infrastructure and, you know, businesses so they could, like, as Europe rebuilt, you know, they would be able to profit and, like, take ownership and stuff like that, blah, blah, blah. Um... But it was, I mean, there was a lot of power plays. So, like, the United States is over here, like, yo, like, our former main competitors are now, like, <laughs> you know, in debt to us, right? So we're going to treat them as such. Meanwhile, like, everyone else who couldn't stand a chance is just going to continue to not stand a chance uh, of, like, resisting our power, right? And so the real only thing we have to worry about is Russia. And we don't even, so <clears throat> one of the big myths about the cold war and it's not like so much a myth because yes nuclear threat was real still is it still is by the way <laughs> so as much as people made a big deal about it then yeah there's something to consider right that we aren't still making a big deal about it now right the question is why right anytime you're like oh yeah the world war was about nuclear whatever it's like those threats have only grown in a very real sense you know since uh yeah. the fall of the berlin wall but my point is the U.S. U.S. central planning, right? So the people in like the Pentagon and the you know the White House, you know, in all of these high-level government buildings associated with you know foreign policy, like what the U.S. relationship with the rest of the world is, they were pretty much like we need to control this shit, right? We have the Russians to worry about, and we're going to worry about them. And the best way to handle that situation is by controlling as much as we can. Um, and also <laughs> the resources, you know, cause again, we go to Africa and this is actually where we're going. So we go to Africa, you know, 
just in general, think of all the conflicts that were going on in the 1950s, right? Like, look in South America, I'm not even going to name it. There was a lot going on. Look at, you, uh, what's it? Asia, right? Like, Korean War, 1950s, you know, uh, whatever. There was, again, a lot going on. And uh, meanwhile, like, Africa is still there with all of these uh, resources, because you know, been dominating, extracting resources from Africa for decades. And now like, you know, nuclear technology is a huge thing. And like the Congo, the Congo has like the prime deposits of uranium, right? So, oh, we got to control the Congo. Um, Cuba's happening. So, oh, we got to control Cuba, you know. And the major thing that, uh, the biggest threat, right? Because again, because so many of the United States sources uh, for like raw material were outside of the country, um, and because those same sources were, you know, like the sources for other nations, right? Like, again, their competitors, England, France, whatever, like the former colonial powers over Africa and the rest of the world. Um, right. I mean, if you've ever played, uh, Risk or like Settlers of Catan, right, it's all about like the resources here. Okay. So one thing that a lot of people think is that, oh, you know, the United States wants to control the Middle East for resources, uh, so we can get all the oil, right? The fact of the matter is if you look at all the, you know, documentation or, you know, like, you know, check your sources always, but the evidence suggests that it's not that we want the oil is that we want to control the oil so we can control the people, the other people who need it, right? Like we have our pipelines, you know, we have our sources, especially now we've got fracking, right? So people would be like, oh, we have, you know, our ways of getting fossil fuels. Why do we need to fuck with anyone else's ways of getting fossil fuels? And the point is, if other people have unfettered access to their own resources, they're going to be, you know, they're going to develop independently. They're going to vote democratically. They're going to do what's in the best interest of their nations instead of doing what's in the best interest of our nation. <laughs> and that's going to fuck us up somehow, you know. And people will lose money. And people, yes. And that's really the thing is like investors in those nations will lose money. Um, so, you know, if you've ever wondered who writes our foreign policy, that's who it is, you know. Bill Gates, Elon Musk, yeah. Fuck them. Rockefellers, yeah. But we, so we're in uh, Israel, and what I'm getting at here is the strategic <laughs> asset theory of like United States support for Israel. And what that says essentially is, um, it's really a hypothesis, it's not a theory, but it surmises that the reason the United States is backing Israel goes back to, again, the 1950s when, like, you know, in 1953, um, the U.S. participated in a coup of, you know, uh, Mossadegh, I forget his first name. He was the uh, d democratically elected prime minister of Ar Iran. And, yeah, 1953, the U.S. overthrew him. Oh, that's where I was going after the Korean War, was <laughs> Iran. <laughs> and overthrew him, installed, like, you know... Um, that's what we do, right? We install <laughs> dictators that we like, you know, and then say they were democratically elected. Um, or we just say that they're like really strong, good people until, you know, like, you know they f failed to do their jobs, right? Like Saddam mm -hmm. Hussein. Um, but Iran was installed. Iran was supposed to be a strategic asset, you know, in the Middle East. Uh, Saudi Arabia was supposed to be a strategic asset, still is. In a sense, and then like people were looking at uh, the United States planners were looking at Israel, being like, "Oh, I mean, they could be of some help, right?" So you know, we're sending them some aid, whatever, blah blah blah. Um, but like in 1967, right? Because from the 50s to the 60s, after the colonial the colonizers had left, uh, you know, on paper, or not on paper, on paper after they left on paper. African nations, right, the, you know, uh, the planners started worrying about what Africa was going to do. That's why you get the assassination of Patrice Lumumba in 1960. You get the ouster of Kwame Nkrumah from Ghana in 1966. And, like, uh, so many other people and, you know, administrations. And, you know, like, this just to name the end points, right, let alone all the stuff that happened leading up to these things. So one of the people, um, Abu Gamal Nasser, his last name was Nasser. I forget his first and middle name or his, whatever, 
but he was the president of Egypt at the time, and he was a Pan-African president of Egypt. So obviously he was like, not only do I am I for an independent Egypt, but I'm for an independent Africa, right? So by 1967, the United States saw him as a threat and wanted to get rid of him, even though like when he started, when he first came onto the scene, the United States was like, oh, you know, maybe we could, you know, maybe we could fucks with him, you know, like, not as in like fuck with him, but like, you know, you know we could get along with him. Then they were like, nah, nah, he's about this democracy shit. He's about this, you know, independent nationalism shit. We got it. We can't do it. So long story short, 67 comes along, six days war with Israel, or it was the Arab-Israeli war. And it was a six day war, I think. I might be getting my conflicts mixed up. But point is, there was a big conflict in 1967 between Egypt, Israel, uh... Possibly, so. anyway, it was an Arab-Israeli conflict. And Israel kicked in at the last minute. You know, the United States was kind of worried, wanted, you know, some, uh, someone to step in there and take care of, you know, the Arab nations. And Israel did the job. So from 67 onwards, the United States was like, okay, so like Israel's locked in as a strategic asset, you know, to make sure we advance our interests in the region. Um, and that's pretty much what you're seeing today uh, is, you know, like... All of these Arab nations looking at Israel being like, they're like a clear threat to like <laughs> our independence, right? To our autonomy. And um, I mean, if you look at the behaviors of Israel, like not only internally uh, from that point on, like, okay, so we get um, 67. Something else that's important to note is that as a part of that war, that, you know, very short war, that uh, armed conflict, Israel forcibly invaded parts of Palestine, right? Like to take over more land in Palestine. And that was, you know, um, so there was a UN resolution that, you know, 242 that eventually said, um, nah, you can't do that. Like whatever land you took in Palestine, whatever land you took in into Egypt, right? Like you got to give that back. And what that did was establish like internationally recognized borders that people agreed upon. Okay, so at first, you know, the Palestinians were like, ah, oh, I that mean, like people agreed well, upon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because by this point, it was like you know, it'd been twenty years. I mean, like obviously, still a lot of Palestinians, you know, who were you know alive, you know, and kind of upset about this whole um, situation, right? Um, but. Yeah, I mean, I'm not even going to try to speak for Palestinian people at this point. Yeah, like that, that people agreed upon. But, you know, like in general, this, like, this was a unanimous agreement in the UN. Um, and, you know, again, internationally recognized borders uh, for two states to coexist within this land formerly known as Palestine. Uh, so that's a good point to come back to. Uh, we fast forward. Um, into just like Israel, you know, blowing through that and being like, yeah, fuck it, you know, we're going to continue to antagonize. Uh, and then like Palestine responding, being like, fuck it, we're going to like, you know, start fighting back. And then that's when you get into the real serious, like, you know, like violence back and forth. But, you know, again, keeping in mind that it's not just like back and forth violence, it's Israel disregarding international law on a regular basis being backed by the U.S. and by U.S. funding, you know, mostly in the form of, you know, military aid, which again is great for American investors who, uh, like military industrial investors. Um, and, you know, I guess this is just another, you know, like callback, but 1950s, for most of it, the president was Eisenhower. And the thing, like, if you know President Eisenhower for one thing during his presidency, not during like his general tenure during world war ii and before but for one thing as president it's his warning at the end of his presidency like he was leaving office and he was like yo watch out for this military industrial conflict <laughs> i mean complex you know like what he was saying is yo for the past decade we've been spending so much money on the military and yes that's been great because it's been boosting our economy like you know like people are, are buying stuff and we're able to go out and like conquer land right but we got to watch out because this is not some shit that we should be dependent on. We should not become dependent on like this military industrial complex that we've developed under my administration. You know, fast forward like 70 years later, 
and uh, <laughs> we're still there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to finish for now. <laughs> I think, you know, one of the other pieces around, even if you're somebody who believes in war, which, I mean, really, I feel like you should check yourself, but um, the Israeli uh, assaults are disproportionate, right, to like what the fighting back is from Palestinians, <clears throat> and they use Hamas as, well, Hamas is a terrorist organization, so we're um, like fighting back against Hamas, which as you know, the United States is all about having a war on terror, right? So they're, of course, going to support that. And when in reality, the Palestinians don't have tanks, they don't have an army, right? Like, they don't have any of the stuff that Israel has, right? The Israeli military is legit combing the streets with all of their fucking weapons and then carpet bombing. And the Palestinians are in landlocked spaces where they can't get out of, they don't have anywhere to go, right? It's like putting a bunch, they're just herding people into spaces and carpet bombing them. They don't have anywhere to go because if they go somewhere, the army will kill them or the military will kill them, right? So this idea that it's a conflict and there is violence on both sides or this is a both sides issue is complete bullshit, right? It's the Palestinians and Hamas, <clears throat> are responding to Israeli occupation and pushing and pushing and pushing further and further and further. And they are fighting back and pushing back and using violent resistance to do that. And that's where these both sides conversations come into play when people are like, there needs to be like a ceasefire on both sides and I condemn all violence, right? And it's the same narrative over and over and over again around peaceful resistance and we'll accept it if it's peaceful but like you won't because the Palestinians weren't doing anything when you came in and took their fucking land right mm -hmm. so that should be something like I really um that is one of those like mainstream narratives that is just the way that the media and the way that the U.S. government and government officials and the Israeli government and government officials in other countries you know across the world are molding their message around that to increase people's terror around like Hamas and terrorism and fear and like, look, the Palestinians are launching rockets at us. I mean, it is, it's, it's just, it's false. Like it is wrong and you can see that in the death toll. You can see that in, um, in the, the land destruction right and then you have like media outlets in the United States covering when an Israeli child was murdered by a Palestinian by like a Hamas rocket or something like that right where it's a whole page of coverage about this story is it terrible that that child was killed yeah it was there's no story about the 32 Palestinian kids who were murdered in that same day by Israel's you know bombs and by the police right so it is not a both sides thing. The United States is just as much to blame as Israel is in this. And so trusting mainstream media in the United States is, um, is not going to get you an actual picture of what's going on. Right? And similarly, there's this question that keeps, or it's not a question, there's a statement that keeps popping up that supporting Palestine is... Um, yeah. And believe, yeah, as anti-Semitic, like believing in a free Palestine, supporting the Palestinian people is anti-Semitic because somehow that means that like people are against Jews. And that is like a complete and absolute bullshit too, right? That is a false equivalency. That is not what that means. The Israeli government is a violent government. Anti-Semitism is wrong, right? Like we should all be condemning anti-Semitism. And if you can't, Oppression is all tied together. Anti-Semitism is a form of oppression. The Israeli government is oppressing Palestinian people. And if you can't make that connection there and what the, the Israeli government is doing, and that that's not furthering the Jewish cause or furthering a fight against anti-Semitism, that's not what they're doing. They are stealing land and lining their pockets 
in the face of creating a peaceful place for Jews to exist. I mean, that's just, it's nonsense. And the United States is all about it, right? The same United States who didn't want Jewish people in the country, who does not condemn anti-Semitism, who does not like really go after anti-Semites or hate crimes right. in that capacity, right? Yeah. These are the same people. Yeah. And I mean, to, I don't know if it needs clarification. I feel like it does just because it's, you know, so many people have a hard time getting it. You know, like when Julia says this is a, a both, this isn't a both sides issue, right? Like I know a lot of people are going to be out there, not necessarily people who are listening to this, but like people out there being like, but it is, right? Because people are focusing on the violence only. And if you only look at the violence, then yes, it is a both sides issue. But again, when we're talking about not oversimplifying things, not hyper reducing things to the point that it's absurd to even consider it, right? Um, because violence doesn't happen in a vacuum unless you're a psychopath. And even then, you know, like there's some sort of, you know, like rationale behind it, right? Neurological imbalance or whatever, neurochemical. What I'm getting at is that the way to understand the role violence plays in this, right? is you listen to what both sides are saying as their justifications for violence. So there's two things here. There's that, and then there's the right to violence itself. So don't let me forget that, because that's really important. But right when you listen to why Israel is <laughs> bombing, what are they saying? They're saying, we are committing these acts of violence against these people because they committed acts of violence against us. Self-protection. Right, or yeah, it's all self-defense. And you can take that at face value and be like, okay, yes, boom. But then you enter like this really, it's not even precarious. It's just a dangerous space to be in where like violence beget, literally violence begets violence. And the justification for um, <laughs> perpetuating violence is either the, in response to violence that has been committed or in anticipation of violence that will be committed against you. And it, in terms of international law, that's ridiculous. Like that, that's not a place to be in, right? Like if Hitler was like, yeah, you know, I killed 6 million Jews because I anticipated that they were going to commit violence against me in the future. Like, that's not it. <laughs> that is, that's a no go. No one does that. You know, like, uh, sorry, not no one does that, but no one should do that. And my point being, if you listen to the Palestinians, right. And say, okay, why are you committing this violence? You say, oh, I don't, you know, like one, they're literally, you know, like committing this physical violence like blowing our shit up you know on the reg with like high-tech military grade weapons you know from the united states but two they're also like literally kicking us out of our homes you know they're invading our neighborhoods they're again gentrification on steroids right like there's violence being perpetuated by the state of israel against palestinian people that transcends the like the, the overt physical violence right and that's the violence that we need to be paying attention to because if you stop Palestinians from committing, like if you only focus on the violence, if you stop Palestinians from committing the violence that they're, you know, doing in self-defense, right? What's going to happen is looking at historical trends, the land of Palestine is going to get smaller and smaller. More Palestinian people are going to die. There's going to be fewer Palestinian people. And then in no time at all, there's going to be no Palestinian people and they will have been genocided. Whereas if you stop Israel from committing the same violence, or again, violence and self-defense, what's going to happen, uh, I mean, presumably at this point, right, again, if we're only focusing on the violence, is um, Israel's going to do the same thing, right? It's what I just described, except it might take a little longer because Palestinians will still be responding in some way to the general encroachment of land and blah, blah, right? Like my point is if you take the violence out of the equation on both sides, <laughs> you're going to see the same, like the violence that people are talking about, sorry. If you take the violence that people are condemning on both sides out of the equation, what you're gonna have is the exact same, you know, like procedures of colonialism and like, you know, genocide without guns and bombs, right? It's right. going to be all done with paper, right? That stuff is expediting it. Right. Right, like it's murdering people as opposed to pushing them out of the homes and out of the country until they die elsewhere and can't come back. Right. So when you look at it that way, you have to say, okay, uh, I see what you're saying. <laughs> so say it. <laughs> if you don't get it, repeat after me. 
I don't get it. And then rewatch this video. But if you do get it and you just got it, say, I, I get it. All right, good. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. You know, progress. Comment, you know, down below. Um, the point is to resolve the state violence from Israel that is going unacknowledged, right? Because that is the violence that matters, right? Again, look at these maps. Look at UN Resolution 242, right? The big thing that it didn't do was explicitly name Palestine as, you know, a state that had the right to exist, right? It just, you know, talked about territorial borders and, like, named Israel, right? So that worked out in Israel's favor because, you know, technically the state of Palestine isn't recognized by the UN, right? You see how that works out. But when we're talking about easy solutions, again, two-state solution. Like, that's been on the table for decades. The Arab League, right, like the League of Arab States, you know, Egypt, Iran, you know, like Syria, Lebanon, people have been, like, in support of this two-state solution, okay? So when people are like, the Palestinians, they don't want anything except the bomb people. Like, no, that's not true. Like, of course they want to live in peace. Of course they don't want to get bombed. And of course they don't want to do all this bombing, right? Give them space to do that, okay? Agree to these borders, right? Give this land back, you know, land back. Um, and then just on the right to self-defense, and I'll try to be finished there, is that when you look at the UN Charter, right? Like... The right to self-defense exists only in the context of having exhausted every other means. Sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, a state only, only, only has the right to self-defense by use of force, right? Because again, we're, we have to qualify, right? Like there's lots of ways to defend yourself, especially in a geopolitical sense, diplomacy being amongst them, right? Foremost amongst them. So a state only has the right to self-defense by use of force, if and only if that state, or under the condition that that state has exhausted all, all other means of self-defense, okay? So if Julia, <laughs> we're not gonna go there, no. Okay, so right, like what that means is in the cases that Israel goes in and says, hey, you know, like we're gonna go in like defend ourselves, they can only use bombs, they can only use guns, they can only send in the military, if before doing that, right, in response to something, they said, okay, hey, we didn't like that at all, let's talk it out, what do you want, we're willing to make, you know, some agreements, some concessions, we're willing to work with you on this, so that that doesn't happen, okay, and that doesn't happen, mm -hmm. like, Israel's literally like, oh, boom, like, someone threw a stone at us, let's get them, you know, and this isn't the first time that Israel has shown this much force either. So I think that's really important to remember that this isn't um, like a one-time thing. It's been going on for decades and decades. And the U.S. has supported it for decades and decades, right? And the U.N. is a joke, as we just um, also experienced, right? Israel's breaking international law repeatedly. There's no consequence for it at all, right? Obama was like... Hey Israel, I have thirty-eight billion dollars. We promise you, you need to defend yourself and protect yourself, right? So, um, and that's being held up with the Biden administration too. And you know, like Trump obviously did his thing. Um, and I also like really want to stress, I guess, two things. Like one. The Palestinian people don't have anywhere to go, right? It's not like they get a warning about, oh shit, this thing is coming, let me go somewhere else, right? That's not happening. They're in walled areas um, and can't, they can't escape anywhere. And the Israelis are bombing schools and hospitals, hospitals and COVID testing sites and likely targeting specialist doctors reporters, right? They fucking blew the building where Al Jazeera and AP were, right? So they have a strategy and they're following through with it. And the other thing that I really want to stress too is that do not let a violent resistance be a reason to stop supporting the resistance, right? We know throughout history that oppressors determine what is an acceptable way for people to rise up and fight back. 
right? And we have to be willing to support and understand that like if we're not there on the ground and we have to support the people who are there on the ground, right? They know what they're doing and they know what's needed and we have to trust that and be with them. So do do not let the fact that there is, you know, like resistance on their end in a way that you might not agree with push you away from supporting a free Palestine and the Palestinian people and their efforts to liberate themselves from the Israeli occupation. Yeah. And I would say, especially, right, like what Julia said goes across the board, but that's especially true if you're not going to lift a finger to do anything about it, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're just going to be it back, you know, but, mm, I don't agree with that violence. And also not do anything to like understand the situation or end the violence Shut the fuck up, you know? Uh, and I guess as far as what to do, because again, like one of the major important things to note for, especially for American audiences, is that here being in America, like this is where the problem is, right? American funding gets withdrawn from Israel. Israel stops, right? Like Israel has to listen to the United States, you know, because of the money, right? Um so big thing to keep in mind is that as far as BDS, you might have heard that as a possible solution to addressing the problem because, you know, again, podcast point is to like help uh, point out like context and then address the problem. Boycott, um, divest, sanctions. Right. Boycott, uh, boycott, divest, sanctioning from like businesses that support whatever conflict. They did it in South Africa, do it all over the world, right, to varying degrees of success. A lot of people are like, oh, yeah, BDS is real. All right, but like Israel isn't funding itself, you know? So if you boycott, divest, sanction from like businesses in Israel, like, yeah, I mean, yeah, they might feel it, but like, you know, that's the easy target. The hard target is the United States, and it's only the hard target, one, because so many people aren't paying attention to it, right? Like, Israel is a great distraction for the United States um, in that sense. So, like, and we can post those too. What do you mean? I mean, there's like lists out there of uh, companies too. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll do that. And then also just keep in mind like this stuff, like if you're concerned about this now and then election season comes along and you're like, mm, I'll vote for someone who supports foreign wars mm -hmm. or like gives billions of dollars annually to like hostile foreign governments. <laughs> What's the big deal? Like Joe, right? Jim Crow Joe. Like I'm telling y'all, like we're telling y'all, you know, that's some fuck shit. So like this stuff I mean, like Julia said earlier, everything's connected, right? Like, not just as far as forms of oppression, but everything, okay? So if people are telling you, oh, I'm not voting for this person because the stuff they do outside of this country is really, like, the stuff they support is terrible, listen to them and then vote for someone who's doing something better. Because mm -hmm. he was candid about this. Like, he wasn't open, you know, in front of it, but he wasn't like, yo, yeah, no, I'm not going to, like, deviate from decades of, you know, like, U.S., policy towards Israel like I'm not gonna do that. whereas Bernie Sanders was like yeah fuck that shit you know like <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah, that's all yeah. I'm saying um yeah I mean like those things are important and then um oh being here like you said you know like like if you're here now right like be here um don't just move on to the next thing, right? There's a ceasefire. That doesn't mean the violence has stopped, right? Like, as Kojo mentioned before, the it is deplorable. Like, the way that the Israeli government is treating Palestinians, um, even when they're not bombing them, right? So, like, be here and stay here. And, like, this is work to be done um, and will be until there's a free Palestine. And that impacts, because of the U.S.'s involvement, then impacts, right, like the liberation struggles here in the United States and across the globe. And just because you're staying here doesn't mean you have to, like, only be here. You can be in other places, too. Mm -hmm. Other struggles. Just keep your attention on this one. Mm -hmm. uh, important stuff in the description below. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. See you all in the next one. Bye.